Hi. Apologies for that. I couldn't resist. Now if I can just avoid falling into a thick Idaho burr for the remainder of this video. All right, so we're here today to talk about the West, the Wild West, not the cultural West and not the geographical West. The cultural West is something else altogether. I'll talk about that in some other video videos. I do mean to briefly discuss the geographical West, but only insofar as it is directly connected to the idea of the Wild West. More on all of that later. By the way, this present topic is intimately related to some news that I have for y'all, which I will be revealing at the end of this video. So you want to stick around right until the bitter end, because, well, news. Now, I aim to talk about the West as a son of the West. In the first place, I'd best give you my creds. I'm originally from Idaho. Owing to the rootlessness of my youth and to certain peculiarities of my character, I have a strange accent. And for this, and possibly for some other reasons as well, I don't always come off as a country boy from Idaho, but I assure you, I very much am. For any of my non-American viewers out there, Idaho is this state here. The one that's shaped like a fat, lumpy L. Or a crusty, upside-down hatchet. That one. I spent my very first years in the Stanley Basin of Idaho not far away from Sun Valley, in a clear view of the Sawtooth Mountains, in a log cabin that my father, himself one of the last of the dying race of mountain men, built with his own hands. I was born in a hospital in Sun Valley, just a stone's throw away from where Ezra Pound was born. Like Ezra Pound, I am a lifelong lover of poetry. Like Ezra Pound, I write poetry that a lot of people seem to find alien and weird. Driven by some innate and difficult-to-explain gravity, I moved to Italy later in life, as did Ezra Pound. It was only in Italy that I learned about Ezra Pound. It was only in Italy that Ezra Pound learned about me. Strange parallels, no? What do you think? Any resemblance? Maybe the profile. <laughs> do I want to resemble Ezra Pound? Yeah, probably. The man's got a great name, you can't deny him that. Anyway, all of this Pound business is actually related to my theme. I promise. I'll explain why sooner or later. So when I was younger, I moved around a lot, but apart from a brief stint in the Big Apple, I spent most of my first, say, 25 years exclusively in the great American West. Idaho, then Arizona, then back to Idaho, and then down to New Mexico. So I've been around, friends. I've seen a thing or two down on that there country. I'm the son of pioneers on my father's side. My great-grandmother Nellie drove westward in a covered wagon, and a legend grew around her. See, she was famous for carrying this cast iron skillet with her, with which she was said to beat off the Indians. Sadly, I can't corroborate these rumors, but I do know for a fact that when my father was a boy, she would carry him on her back and beat off rattlesnakes with a stick. Alas, stories about beating off Indians are a little bit faux pas nowadays, but that's part and parcel of the mystique of the West. In the Wild West, all bets are off. Our tame spirit of political correctness stands about as much of a chance of surviving and thriving in the Wild West as a houseplant transplanted into the Sonoran Desert. The West represents a land where the human laws are feeble or even altogether absent, and this leads to magnificent drama and conflict. The man of the Wild West is left to his own devices. This is both practically and socially, legally and morally. He has to make do as he can, which leads to two overriding themes, two different ways of dealing with this lawless situation. On the one hand, we see the attempt to replace laws by force, rules by raw power. We see men rising by dint of their strength, their wile, their ruthlessness, seizing whatever they desire, be it gold or whiskey or women, and living out their days in abandon and violence until they are crushed by the same. On the other hand, we see a sublime attempt to substitute an iron inner moral sense for an absentee society. Here resides the myth of the stoic and virtuous cowboy, the sheriff. This is an embodiment of a particularly Western American ideal of manhood. It has definite parallels to a European idea of manhood as such, but there are peculiarities to it which render it unique. As a man by this standard, you live by the moral compass that you have within you. You do right and you keep your word, no matter how much it costs you. You learn how to survive and you endure hardship in silence. And you build this strength, these skills, this efficiency into your very fiber. You speak little and forthright, act when acting is needed, and mind your own business until you are forced to do otherwise, either by circumstances or by the evil actions of men. These men live by the light of their inner sense of goodness and justice, putting down the outlaw and the scoundrel alike, until they at last break upon their very inflexibility. So this dichotomy that I presented here between the classic Western outlaw and the classic Western man of uh, moral uprightness is 
clearly an oversimplification. And indeed, some of the best Western film and fiction unites these two strands. I'm thinking of things like Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven or Cormac McCarthy's Borderland trilogy. Also the film Jeremiah Johnson and the book upon which it was based, Mountain Man. This kind of art rides in the space between these extremes. It shows the conflict of the man who is caught between the paladin and the monster in his own soul. The man is struggling to rise to one or to the other, but is kept back by his own debilities. See, the West is a vast existential theater in which the human drama is played out. Everything in the Wild West is reduced to its essential elements. All of the superfluous, all of the dross are cut away. We see these same themes played out to some extent in seafaring and adventure film and uh, literature. Things like Joseph Conrad and Robert Louis Stevenson. But there are a number of other dynamics at play here, a number of more direct connections to civilization which renders these particular genres a little bit different from the Western, and in this the Western maintains its uniqueness. The only setting that really compares to it is the new frontier of outer space in science fiction. And these are strangely related genres, so that it's not at all odd to see a certain overlapping between the two of them. In things like the television series Firefly, popular culture like Back to the Future, there was another series Briscoe County Jr., which also had elements of them both. There's also the video game series Fallout, which I think represents as well a kind of intersection between these two. But there are important differences between outer space and the Wild West. I think the most important of these is that the Wild West is a historical fact. It really existed in the history of North America, and by extension in the history of Europe. All fictional work based on it calls us back to that bedrock reality. Science fiction tends to move in vast spaces of grand speculation. That's its particular charm and beauty. The Western, on the other hand, tethers the imagination to a reality. And a reality, what's more, which is cast in the hardest of all possible lights. It's a reality which brings us to a bare-bones natural state. And I think that this is actually connected in interesting and subtle ways to the old Enlightenment theories of the so-called state of nature, which we see propounded in philosophers like Hobbes and John Locke and Rousseau. These philosophers hypothesized a condition prior to the advent of society and civilization, a time before the introduction of law and private property, in which human beings lived in a kind of primordial wilderness. The guiding question of this philosophical strand is, what would human life look like in the absence of even the most rudimentary social structures? And there was some disagreement here. Hobbes is famous for calling that life solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Rousseau took a considerably more sanguine, not to say utopian, view on the matter. Locke, characteristically, finds himself somewhere between. Now, it's an open debate as to whether these philosophers were proposing the state of nature as an actual historical reality somewhere in our collective past, or whether they meant it instead as a kind of metaphysical foundation for a secular morality, very much in line with the Enlightenment abandonment of Christianity and the attempt to establish philosophy on what was considered the firmer grounding of science. That debate doesn't interest us at present. But what does interest us is the way in which the Wild West represents a kind of post-civilized state of nature. It represents an epic artistic experiment. If we were to throw modern man, this child of millennial European culture and a predominantly Christian heritage, into a rugged, sparsely populated wilderness, what would come of that? What would we learn from or about this man? his ideals? What would we learn about the human condition? How do the morals, the philosophies, the metaphysics, the religion with which we were raised stand up in these ungovernable and harsh conditions? And here we find the beauty and the richness of the Western in the variety of the responses that it gives to this challenge. There seem to be in general several major strands, which I'm going to identify here purely for the sake of convenience as the optimistic, the tragic, and the nihilistic. Note that I do not include the category realist. Realism is a non-category in art. Art is never realistic. It is never just stupidly mimicking reality, and it's unclear what that would even mean. Art is always saying something definite about the reality surrounding us. It is always propositional. It is always telling us what reality is. All art and no art is realist, because, <laughs> you know what? I'll just do a video on this. Back to Westerns. So these different categories that I very briefly described actually fall to some extent into different categories of our popular Western art. You can often see the optimistic approach reflected in John Wayne, and you can often see the tragic in Clint Eastwood. The nihilistic is a little bit harder to come by, but no less striking than that. You have to look at people like Sam Peckinpah or Cormac McCarthy to see really clear instances of what that might look like. The more popular and I think the more principal division is between John Wayne and Clint Eastwood on this one, or something like that. That's a little fast and loose, I know, but I think there actually is something to this. You know, George Steiner once wrote, a book, one of the finest pieces of literary criticism that I've ever read, called Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. I think someone should do the same thing for Clint Eastwood and John Wayne, if somebody hasn't done this already. 
maybe somebody has. I have the sense that there's a profound metaphysical distinction in types of American souls, depending on whether you prefer John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. If nobody's done this, somebody really should. I mean, will somebody please write this book? Look, I don't want to have to write this book. I do not have time to watch all of those John Wayne movies. I don't want to watch all of those John Wayne movies, apart from The Searchers and maybe The Alamo. But I mean, all of the others? Someone, anyone, save me. Anyway, you can see that I'm an Eastwood man myself. Go ahead, make my day. Dying ain't much of a living boy. Kid, we all got it coming. In my view, the Westerns which attempt to romanticize the West fall short of the artistic ideal. They are very often flat and insufficient. And I think it's because they neglect the vital tension which is at the very heart of the West. If I had to sum this up in just a single sentence, I think it would be found in the insight that the beauty and the power of human virtue is not found in its near accordance with the spirit of the world, but in its persistence, despite the fact that that spirit and it stand at odds with one another. That is the heroism which you see embodied in the West. That is the magnificence of the ideal of the cowboy and of the lawman. And to a certain extent, I think that this insight actually includes all three of the primary strands of the Western that I identified before. It integrates and interweaves these three types into a single solid strand. It recognizes the truth at the bottom of the nihilistic experience, which is to say that there really is something in the world which is really and horrifyingly indifferent to the plight and the destiny of man. And it recognizes that this basic fact about the world leads to tragedy. But it also recognizes that there is something transcendent which stands over that. It does not stop at the nihilistic experience. It does not stop at the tragic view of existence. It surpasses that. It overcomes it. And I'm tempted to say that this is actually the Christian theme, the Christian influence in the genre of the Wild West. This recognition that the nihilism and the tragedy of the world are actually the precondition for an inexplicable and divine hope. That seems to me to be the constant of the best exemplars of this genre. Tragedy, owing to the terrifying harshness of the world, but tragedy somehow strangely illuminated by a ray of hope. So this is handled in many different ways, and I think that there are many different valid ways of handling it. It doesn't even necessarily have to be overly serious. I think that there are real gems in the strange genre of the comic western. I'm thinking of films like They Call Him Trinity, which is just this wonderful, delightful, tongue-in-cheek spaghetti western, and The Ballad of Cable Hogue by the aforementioned Sam Peckinpah. One of my favorite westerns of all time is actually a comedic and musical western. I'm convinced that it's a retelling of the rise and fall of ancient Rome, and it stars, I kid you not, Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin. It has to be one of its kind. I'm speaking, in any case, of the inimitable, the peerless, Paint Your Wagon. But what's really striking about all of these comedic westerns is the way that they actually point to the same underlying themes that I've been talking about throughout the course of this video. Now, of course, what makes all of this possible, the grand theater in which this grand drama plays out, is the actual geographical Wild West, the landscapes and the terrains that make it possible. There is a certain stark magnificence to these landscapes which lends itself relentlessly to the Western genre. From the deserts to the Rocky Mountains to the forests, this landscape is absolutely iconic and for very good reason. It is an atmosphere which is artistically unique and gives rise to possibilities that one really can't find replaced anywhere else. But even underlying this kind of aesthetic or outward appearance of this place, there's something even deeper here. The geographical idea of the West is a very interesting concept. It implies necessarily that the geography the geography of the planet itself has a starting point and an end point, something which is obviously not true if you look at the sphere, the globe of our planet. Just looking at that globe from a completely third-person point of view without any cultural references whatsoever, the idea of east and west is completely relative. There's no way of determining what actually means east or west. It all depends on where you're standing. And yet, it would be totally inappropriate to call Japan the west, even if one is standing on the utmost coast of California. So it would seem that the Pacific Ocean, for a variety of geographical, but also cultural and historical reasons, has become the denominating line determining the difference between east and west. But this throws a very interesting problem into the mix. What happens when that frontier, that extremity, that denominating line has been met? What happens when the limit is reached, and all of the land of the West is developed and populated, and manifest destiny has been fulfilled? What happens when the only wildernesses yet remaining are fenced in by civilization? The drive from Europe to the West has always been a drive into the unknown, into wilderness, into the unexplored, the uncultivated, into the savage. This is bound up with ideas like manifest destiny and the westward thrust. The frontier is shifted. It 
moves. It becomes perhaps the deep sea or the Arctic or outer space. But these are not accessible to most people. Most people have to look for the West elsewhere, and they will look for it. Because that Western impetus, that desire to strike out and find new lands, which was carried hence by the pioneers, was surely transmitted to their children. And it evidently exists as part of our European heritage in some corner of our common genealogy. It's part and parcel of what it means to be a Westerner. And where does this urge go when there are no longer any physical frontiers? It strikes back to the East, or it goes inward. It might, for instance, be manifested in the American who turns back to Europe to explore the past as if it were a new frontier. This happened, for example, with my boy Ezra Pound, as much a son of the West as anyone I know. It might also fly to the Far East, seeking there something exotic and unknown, adventures with new experiences or new places. Or it might unfold artistically, bringing the West as a concept into writing, into film, into song. In its most corrupted form, it might show in the form of violent incursions into the social order, organized crime or the lone wolf criminal, people who shun the laws of the city and live and die by their almost anarchic whims. And it shows as well in certain virtues which we Americans have traditionally held in high regard. Things like self-reliance, bravery, and candor. Self-reliance meaning knowing how to stand on one's own legs, knowing how to do for oneself, not being beholden to anybody else. Integrity and honor and dignity are bound up in this. Bravery as well. It's not merely an act of courage now and then, but it's rather a state of confronting the world, uh, a way of looking at the world without fear and without the dread of what's going to happen next, being ready to face any circumstance, no matter how difficult or painful. The idea of candor is rather the sense of honesty and straightforwardness. The ability to look at the world for what it is, to speak clearly on that, without illusion and without naivety. These are the conditions for living in the West, whether it be geographically or psychologically. Because the West, in the last analysis, is not a place. It's not a genre. It's a state of soul. It is the same inner condition which sent some of my ancestors hurtling across inhospitable and hazardous terrain to build a civilization in the wilderness. It's the spirit which carries the cowboy off into the sunset at the end of those great films. And that classic trope of the cowboy who rides into the sunset is so symbolically rich. It's not just a nice way to end a story. It is a summation of a spirit, of a way of being. The West is the place where the sun sets. This suggests an ending, but it also suggests a new beginning. The man who heads west is chasing the sun wherever it goes. He's seeking a new dawn as he seeks that sunset. This, I think, accounts for a very interesting part of the American dynamic. This kind of ceaseless restlessness, this desire to constantly be on the move, to constantly find new horizons. Seeking one's happiness, for example, which I think is a characteristically American preoccupation. But it's also related to the psychology of the artist and of the philosopher. There's a common error here, I think, which is that the West is somehow connected with ignorance or with lack of knowledge about history and about culture. The cowboy is ignorant and uncivilized, something like this. But there are exemplars in our culture which speak very much of the contrary. And this is represented, I think, as well in characters like Liberating Johnson in Mountain Man. This is a great beast of a man who knew the classics. He would whistle classical music as he was standing in a thunderstorm on the mountains. This beautiful, beautiful combination of seemingly dissonant elements. Think as well of Doc Holliday, who's just another great figure along these lines. See, the men of the West actually carries Europe with him as he goes into the West. And this makes for this, this fascinating tension and almost, in many cases, a contradiction. It's a contradiction which characterizes, I think, a sizable portion of our American experience, going all the way back to men like Emerson and Thoreau. The man who drives west often seeks to escape civilization, but he can only do so by establishing civilization where he goes. He is carrying with him, he is encouraging the very thing that he would evade. The west often represents this incredible longing to somehow merge civilization and raw, untamed nature. When this evidently contradictory desire becomes self-conscious, it reaches its heights. Thoreau is an embodiment of the Western spirit in this sense. So, I would argue, is Ezra Pound. There's a poem in which Ezra Pound repeats several times the same lines. The thought of what America would be like if the classics had a wide circulation troubles my sleep. This is from the Cantico del Sole, which means the little song of the sun, which again is so rich in symbolism because the West is connected to the sun, to the going of the sun. The West is in that way a promise. The West, even to this day, still now, is a promise. And its embodiment and its artistic expression is one of the great gifts that my country, the United States, I think can still bring to the world. And it can do so in a totally unique and characteristic way. There are a number of different books and works that I'd like to discuss here, but I'm running out of time, so I'm afraid I can't. I'll have to put that off to a different set of videos. 
but I think that there's so much here still to explore, so much that still needs to be brought out, so much that still needs to be given to the world. And I can't help but feeling that this is a calling for American artists in particular. And particularly, if we can somehow unite the Western to the deeper European heritage that we have, in an awareness of what it means to be an American, both as a child of Europe and as a child of this new experience. Because the thought of what America would be like if the classics had a wide circulation troubles my sleep too. There's so much more to be done here, so much more to explore. Which brings me to this. At the beginning of this video, I promise news. And friends, when I promise, I deliver. Some weeks ago, I floated on X the possibility of my publishing a serialized novel. I suggested a few possible themes and asked for you to vote on those. Well, the results are in, the people have spoken. And in this case, Vox Populi Vox Scriptoris. And that first Vox in this present case is most convenient for that second Vox, which is just to say that the results of this particular poll corresponded conveniently with a novel that I have actually already been writing. So starting next week, and free to anyone who wants to take a gander, I'm going to be publishing a Western. I'll be publishing it section by section, one week at a time. From here on out, it's probably going to be a long one, so this could last a while. I won't give anything away about it yet, save to say that it may or may not involve a gold mine, Nisha in cowboy form, an exiled Italian aristocrat, and a latter-day odyssey in specially American key. So I hope you'll join me for that. Subscriptions are open, friends, so paint your wagon and come along. In the meantime, let me know down in the comments what your favorite Western is and what you think about this genre. Let me know if you like this video, if you think that anything I said uh, made any sense, or if you think I just made a terrible hash of things and should probably be punished by burying me up to the neck, not far away from an ant pile, Comanche style. This coming Friday, I'm going to be continuing my course in fiction self-editing with a video on world building. At least, I think. I think that's what's coming next. Don't hold me to that. My life has pretty much become this endless, indecipherable series of faceless video reels, and I've pretty much lost track completely of what day it is or where I am, so... I strayed out of thought and time. Alright, anyway, thank you all so much for joining me to the end, and farewell to you.